provide new gadgets and talk about the latest in gaming. But those shows are just the tip of the iceberg, and we're here for the deep dive. The difference between technology consumers and those who live the business day to day. And our viewers recognize that. The market begged for a program to fill that, that void. We're not, not just touting off headlines. Our goal is to provide you with, with a story, but we also want to analyze the big picture and ask the questions that, that no one else is asking. Our guests aren't just here to provide commentary. We work with analysts who know the industry from the inside out. The tech business isn't new. But many networks treat it as if it is, and really barely scratch the surface on technology coverage. We follow the expansion of the cloud and the evolution of big data. We're covering new enterprises from startup to IPO and every move in between. So what do you think was the source of this misinformation? So you mentioned briefly uh, there, there are several other of us as a companion to the cube. We're here every morning trying to extract the signal from the noise. Where the cube excels in event coverage, we're working to bring that experience to you consistently every morning. We use the top stories of the day to provide you with breaking analysis so that you can forecast future trends. Uh, we're here before you even wake up. We're creating a fundamental change in the news coverage. Laying the foundation and setting the standard. And this is just the beginning. Going to Disneyland. Going to Disneyland. Yeah. I mean, these guys are great. Um, I think this is a revolutionary forum. Uh, up till a few years ago, I'd never seen this in my entire career. Uh, these guys are great interviewers. They're spot on, they're sharp, they're funny to work with, and uh, they just ask great questions. So it's, it's a real pleasure to be on the queue. It. It's really great. What's so neat about it is it's like real time discussions and also just being able to have people share their views simultaneously. So I'm I love it. I think it's really fun. It's a great way to, you know, get the message out and to have a dialogue. This is a fantastic way to have the conversation 
with guys who know what's going on, uh, who can, you know, kind of scratch below the surface, who can, you know, respond to what's happening right now on, you know, a, a Twitter feed about maybe some technology that's new in the marketplace and respond and have a conversation. So it's a way to, you know, kind of uh, demystify what's going on for a lot of folks. And uh, for me as a marketing guy, I'm also, you know, really keen on the huge community that uh, has built up and follows, uh, you know, every single, every single uh, uh, post that you guys have got. So it's uh, fantastic, irreplaceable. Actually, it went really, really well. I mean, the thing that I really like about the Cube is you guys get it. I mean, bottom line is we can talk about high-level strategy, we can talk about execution, we can talk about competitive and market. And it, you know, what I like is the uh, interactive banter back and forth. Plus, the fact that uh, you know, when I think about some of the conversations we have, they're not only deep, they're not only rich, but the audience themselves will really come to benefit from those conversations. Good. Also, I think the cube, you guys always have very thoughtful questions, really insightful comments, and it actually makes for a really fun discussion. I, I, I want folks out there to understand the depth of technical inspection that goes on with, with you guys, it's, uh, it's deeper than you know, most analysts we talk to, right? I mean, so we roll up our sleeves. We'll spend a half a day on a hot new technology instead of the you know, PowerPoint eye bleed that goes on you know, a lot of the time in our industry. So it's, uh, you know, it's, when you get a perspective from the queue, that is, uh, you know, that's as good as a validation. Back here live in Silicon Valley, we're at the heart of Silicon Valley, we're in San Jose, San Jose Convention Center for Hadoop Summit. This is the uh, second day of live wall-to-wall -wall coverage, Silicon Angles, the Cube. This is our flagship program where we go out to the events, and extract a signal from the noise, and you know, we'll go where the action is. If there's a story needs to be written, we'll do it. If we want to go out to the floor and do an interview, we'll do that, but here the Cube, we bring in folks who have that signal, those tech athletes, CEOs, entrepreneurs, developers, and occasionally it's people who build huge production Hadoop systems from either Facebook and now working at Nutanix, and that's our next guest here to discuss that, and we're going to have a great conversation around this new model, the new modern era of software, software-led infrastructure, software-defined everything, and obviously Hadoop and big data. I'm John Furrier the founder of SiliconANGLE. I'm joined by my co-host. Hi everybody, this is Dave Vellante from wikibon.org. Karthik Ranganathan is here. He is a technical staff member at uh, Nutanix, and Nutanix is a company that has really had a great deal of success in the hyperscale, bringing a lot of that success into the enterprise. Karthik, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you, very excited to be here. Yeah, so we have been tracking Nutanix for a while. Uh, everybody talks about converged infrastructure. You guys built converged infrastructure from the ground up. Uh, you came to Nutanix fr from Facebook. What attracted you to Nutanix? So at Facebook, we used to manage, we do manage systems of very large and massive scale. So the focus is on performance and the focus is also on manageability and scalability, right? And uh, what I, I, my vision was, let me do this for the industry at large. So that's the thing that attracted me to Nutanix. The vision kind of coincided, that's what Nutanix is doing the convergence, the scale out, so that's that's the angle. We talked a lot on uh, theCUBE, John and I, about the differences between the hyperscale, you know, the pure pure play hyperscale markets and the enterprise markets, and hyperscale, of course, we, is well documented, a lot of really smart people, PhDs, engineers running around, they will spend time on a problem to save money, whereas the enterprise, they don't have as many resources. You know, they have a lot of resources, but maybe not as, you know, deep technical PhDs, they'll spend money to save time. They'll, you know, buy a box. That's <laughs> and right, so that's right. They're looking for companies like Nutanix right. uh, to provide that capability. Um, and 
we see the hyperscale sort of mentality seeping into the enterprise. So is that essentially what Nutanix is trying to do, is, is bridge that gap and talk about that a little bit? Exactly, I think you hit the, the nail on the head there. So uh, with Nutanix, the idea is it's a device. It encompasses all your performance needs by putting in flash, by putting in RAM, CPU, and disk in the ratio you need it so that you can configure a distributed cluster to get to achieve your end and it's all converged. So the nice part is each of these devices has a distributed system built into it, a file system, and you can just add more and more of these and scale out and uh, grow as you need. Now the hard part was when you, and you live this in your world with Facebook, when you scale out like that and you, you're using a shared nothing environment, um, sometimes things get a little lumpy to rebalance things is sometimes a challenge. So uh, companies like Facebook, you, you write a lot of software to, to do that. Mm -hmm. um, how uh, will the enterprise deal with that problem? You're saying Nutanix has that magic sauce already, you're sort of building that out. Where are we in terms of the maturity of that software for the enterprise? Sure. So. Uh, so let me break it down in a slightly different way. Mm -hmm. The magic sauce is a continuum over time. So you see more edge cases, you fix them. You see different kinds of use cases, you adapt. You see more and more data, you scale up to it. So I would say Nutanix has a lot of the magic sauce and we're continually working to put more and more of the sauce with time to stay relevant, right? And that's, mm -hmm. and that's the name of the game. That's Card the fun. Part. That's the fun part. <laughs> One of the things we talk about the cube and we look at the landscape of the big data world, you got to see the pure Hadoop plays, open source has been a big part of that. And now you get the commercial vendors coming in and Dave was kind of referring to, to kind of the old way, which is scale up, buy a bunch of gear, buy an Oracle license for the database, boatload of storage, and use commercial software. <clears throat> Right. You know, you lived and in, in pioneered with Facebook. I was at your talk at HBase uh, 2012. You gave a keynote talking about how you rolled out Hadoop into production and all the nuances and all the, all the uh, benefits that it did. That's a new concept. That is, a lot of people are looking at what Facebook has done with their ops and their dev, their DevOps, as the new way, the modern way to do engineering and to deploy quickly and scale. That's right. So, so in the world now, the enterprise grade as being talked about here, open source has led that charge. What do you see um, for folks out there that are in positions, that are on technical staffs, in large enterprises? What's their mindset? What should their mindset be? How should they look at some of the tooling and the platforms available? What advice would you give them looking at you now, you went from Facebook, now you're at Nutanix, which is pioneering kind of a new way. What, what, what is the mindset and then what should they be doing? So. Um, okay, so I'll say that the most important thing I feel is understanding your own scale. If, if you're going to build something that has to scale, then scale has to be at the forefront of everything. I feel like performance itself is a second, although a very close second, to scale. So the architecture itself from ground up has to have scale in mind. So I think that is one thing, whether it's open source or commercial, it doesn't matter, but as long as the fundamental architecture would scale, and would work with commodity hardware and would handle failures properly, I think that's the first step. That's the first battle won. And then immediately after that, you have manageability. You need to know if something goes wrong, where does it go wrong? How do I fix it? How do I troubleshoot my system? Will my system auto fix itself for the common failure cases? And, and I mean, I'll also throw in like uh, the other side, uh, the other extreme of over-optimizing and over-automating where uh, like automatic fixes itself can lead to a little bit of a, like an unwanted behavior. So it's kind of a trade-off between the two and I think that's what people should go for the most. Uh, performance is always ongoing, so try to keep doing the performance stuff, but upfront built for scale and built for manageability. Yeah, that's an interesting point you're making about automation, right? Because again, the hyperscale is highly automated and and uh, uh, um, whereas the enterprise, of course, is very labor intensive. Right. It's sort of a culture shock for uh, the traditional enterprise to trust the machines to fix themselves and you know, there's a real skepticism there. So, so are you seeing your, your, your customers um, move to that balance or are they resisting? You know, do they believe when you say you can come in and help them find that balance? Or? So I think initially, like you said, it is a shock, right? But slowly working through the, the mindset and trying to talk to them about what sort of scale will they be seeing? What are the benefits of having the convergence? What, are, what is the ease that it can bring to their actual manageability story? 
So people usually turn and that, that usually hits a chord with them. So then they start coming around and try and play with the software and try to understand. And, and then there are questions about what happens if this goes down? What happens if that fails? What happens if on this type of a failure? And working through all of that, I think people usually see the benefits of a, a scale out and distributed architecture. So Karthik, what about Hadoop? We're here at the Hadoop Summit, obviously. You guys are uh, certified now on Hortonworks platform mm -hmm. uh, with regard to, the, I think, the first converged infrastructure you, you announced. That's right. Um, so, so why converged infrastructure for Hadoop? Why, what's, you know, to compare and contrast with bare metal, um, and give us some insight there. Sure, so let me say this in the form of a story, right? Let's take a typical enterprise out there. They are either A, trying to figure out their big data needs and trying to see how they can put it to good use, or B, have a bunch of data in the few terabytes, maybe tens or hundreds of terabytes, and trying to get some meaningful information from it, not necessarily build elaborate pipelines. So this is a typical enterprise. Mm -hmm. So the story here is, would you rather go and try to figure out what sort of hardware you need, try to provision that hardware, try to figure out how to maintain it, try to get a team to maintain it, get a support contract, do your upgrades. That's a laborious process. So even if, like, and the traditional no for, putting, uh, for doing virtualization with Hadoop is the performance angle. That's usually what people say. Firstly, I believe that with convergence, you don't give up much performance because all of your data is local. But even that aside, the bigger story for the enterprises is the manageability aspect. You can manage, like the, the people that are managing the, the data centers right now are very, very familiar with virtualization. So you can run Hadoop in a, in a, in a virtual machine and your admins will already know how to manage it, right? So that's the, that's the first part. The second part is you'd already have a virtualized story. You have VDI, you have server virtualization. You already have some workloads running. You can run Hadoop alongside that and put it to good use and see the benefits before deciding if you want a dedicated cluster, you want to go bare metal, you want to go virtualized, you can get into the depths of it as it starts proving it out to you, as opposed to putting an upfront cost and not knowing where it'll go. Talk about manageability with Hadoop. Obviously, you know, the HBase has been very popular, but the criticism of HBase is obviously bare metal is a key part of it. Um, supporting that, having administrators on it, and managing HBase. Um, and there's some, you know, obviously the product's evolving. Um, Talk about your view technically about where the platform is right now with Hadoop. Obviously the growth is great, everyone's happy, everyone's kind of rowing the boats in the same direction. Maybe a few bumps and bruises along the way between different, different folks, but for the most part, the ecosystem's growing very rapidly. What needs to get done in the Hadoop ecosystem from your perspective to take it the next level up? So the first part is, um, I'll say that in the, on the manageability side, I think it's not just the UI which tells you about how many nodes are alive or what is the utilization of your cluster. There are a lot of soft points. You would like to know what caused those failures. That analysis is usually pretty complicated. There is no one view that gives you the insight into the system. So, uh, like, obviously you're talking about HBase, so let me, um, from the past, right, let me talk about how we did it at Facebook, right? We used to have a, a dashboard which would summarize all our clusters, right? We have a lot of clusters, a lot of machines, right? At that scale, you don't ever think, let me go and figure out what's wrong with these couple of machines. Like, you know, your fingers will probably fall off before you get to all the machines. Like, <laughs> that's the scale. So you look at these charts and you try to zero down on what was going on at the time. Is it a network incident? Is it a disk incident? Are these a bunch of machines? Is it one cluster? Try to zero in as close as you can get and then you start jumping into the machine and looking at it. So that aspect is, like each of the customers have to do that for themselves. So that is one aspect and, and so, so on. So we got we got to wrap up here, but I want to ask you one more question. We have been very impressed with Nutanix as a company. They're here uh, in San Jose area, Silicon Valley. Um, great founder, um, great CEO, great investors. Um, but they're doing things differently. I mean, just you're at Facebook. You're doing all this killer, <laughs> awesome work. Why Nutanix? What what are they doing that's got you really in, uh, engaged to go join the technical team over there? What about Nutanix really got you? Uh, Excited. In a nutshell, they're bringing all the principles that I was really passionate about at Facebook to the industry at large. That's it in a nutshell. So all of the details, the distributed systems behind it, the commodity software, the failure resilience, the management story, the scale out, all of that stuff is all in a, in a simple box, in a simple form factor that anybody can consume, right? So that's the, that's the best part. Yeah, in, in yeah. I mean, you built it from, you guys built it from scratch 
at Facebook, and now they've commercialized essentially the box. We, again, Nutanix is a very impressive company. Uh, thanks for coming on theCUBE and sharing Thank your you. Facebook experiences, and certainly we'd love to have you on again. We'll talk to the folks at Nutanix. We'll convince them to let you be a CUBE regular on our, uh, on our news program. But ultimately, that's the real deal. How do you commercialize what the pioneers built from scratch, and I think Nutanix's uh, performance as a company will, will uh, dictate the, you know, the, the proof points. Uh, congratulations, this is theCUBE. Yeah. Um, we'll be right back with our next guest after the short break. Again, this market's growing, it's changing, uh, it's exciting, Hadoop is really, really growing and lifting, and we're here to bring it all to you from theCUBE. SiliconANGLE and Wikibon's coverage. We'll be right back after this short break. We looked at all the programs out there and identified a gap in tech news coverage. There are plenty of tech shows that provide new gadgets and talk about the latest in gaming, but those shows are just the tip of the iceberg and we're here for the deep dive. There's a difference between technology consumers and those who live the business day to day. And our viewers recognize that. The market begged for our program to fill that void. We're not just touting off headlines. Our goal is to provide you with a story, but we also want to analyze the big picture and ask the questions that no one else is asking. Our guests aren't just here to provide commentary. We work with analysts who know the industry from the inside out. The tech business isn't new, but many networks treat it as if it is, and really barely scratch the surface on technology coverage. We follow the expansion of the cloud and the evolution of big data. We're covering new enterprise from startup to IPO and every move in between. So what do you think was the source of this misinformation? And so you mentioned briefly uh, there are several other... If that's the case, then why does the world need another software as a service player? I like to think of us as a companion to the Cube. We're here every morning trying to extract the signal from the noise. Where the Cube excels in event coverage, we're working to bring that experience to you consistently every morning. We use the top stories of the day to provide you with breaking analysis so that you can forecast future trends. Uh, we're here before you even wake up. We're creating a fundamental change in news coverage, laying the foundation and setting the standard. And this is just the beginning. inside the Cube, we are live in Silicon Valley. We are in San Jose Convention Center. This is uh, siliconangle.com and wikibon.org's exclusive coverage of Hadoop Summit 2013. I'm John Furrier, this is the Cube, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise. I'm um, John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE, joined with my co-host. I'm Dave Vellante of wikibon.org. Welcome everybody, Ben Werther is here, longtime Cube alum. He's the founder and CEO of Platfora, a company bringing Sub-second interactive BI into Hadoop. Uh, ben, welcome back to the Cube. Thank you. Great to be back. You've yeah, so, on, no, you've been, no, I'm just saying, Cube alumni, you've been on from the beginning yes. with the Cube, and now you're a big-time CEO, big financing, growing, big company. Um, what's it like? Yeah, really, really exciting. I think we've, um, you know, I'm, I'm coming coming on when we were at the point where we had a concept, we had the beginnings of a product, and then I think I joined you guys around the time we launched that product. Yep. You know, now we're uh, in market, uh, we're seeing, uh, you know, we're adding, we added our first couple of 4,500 customers, we're really getting momentum that's, uh, that's uh, you know, across different, different uh, verticals, and it's fantastic to see that. So Dave, Dave and I were talking the other day, and um, we were talking about the, the changing nature of this modern era, and it's one of the things that's going on in the enterprise right now is, you have the old school and the new school, and I think you know, it, it's, it's really clear to us, and we've talked about this in the past, old way, new way, and I think at this show, enterprise grade, uh, Ben, has been key. 
and you guys take a different approach. So mm -hmm. uh, give us an update on what, what you guys are doing, yeah, and then let's absolutely. talk about what you guys are doing differently, and how are you guys enabling that innovation for the customers? Sure, absolutely. Our, you know, I think the, the old way is, uh, the, it's, it's, you know, the question is sort of how do you go rebuild the old data warehouse on this new stack of technology, which I, I think there are use cases where that makes sense. But in, in, you know, one of the things that sort of struck, struck us more and more with our, the customers we work with is, hey, the kinds of data you're putting into Hadoop and you want to mix together, these are not data sets that you want to treat the same old way. You, know, you don't want to do traditional uh, sort of state business reporting against you know, these uh, event logs and clickstream data and sort of social graph data. There's so much more interesting questions about behavior and insight that you want to drive from those. And so I think it's really pushing towards um, not just how, you know, how do we make BI work in this environment, but you know, really how do we allow people to kind of express these things that today take custom development, they take a year of smart data scientists and make those questions that a business user can just sit down and ask visually you know, this afternoon. Well, that's why I like having Ben on, John, because you know, let's face it, a lot of the platform vendors here, they, they, they're coexisting, they're working with other large you know, database companies yeah. or traditional BI companies, and they've got to be politically correct. And you were actually quite kind just now, but yeah. I mean, you've been more forceful about, you know, look, you, yes, you can do that, yeah. but there's so much more business value that you can drive yeah. if you kind of rethink the way in which BI is done. Absolutely. Uh, and we've Absolutely. talked about this before, that BI in many ways has just failed to live up to its promises. Mm -hmm. so, so what are you seeing today, and, and what gives you confidence that your vision will mm -hmm. be able to live up to its promise? Yeah, um, I, I mean, I think the clearest, the, the clearest indication is customers using the product. Um, you know, we, uh, nothing gets me more excited than you know, going into an organization and there's often naysayers who say, hey, we have these existing investments, how, do you go, how are you going to leverage whatever, you know, the microstrategy and the other tools I have? And our, and our point is, okay, look, that, that, that's fine to have for the existing use cases, the, you know, they're good products, but let's talk about the kinds of things you're trying to answer, the kind of data you're, you're bringing together, and let's look at what you're, what you're trying to achieve. And we, we rapidly see there's business users disenfranchised, data sets that often have you know, much more interesting character. You know, if I'm getting clickstream data, every record I may have you know, dozens or hundreds of different tags of different things that I can use for interesting segmentation, uh, different types of behavioral analytics. I, wanna, I can look at combining these data sets in surprising ways. Um, and you know, the, idea, the idea that you're going to try to do that uh, you know, the, the idea that even if you made the traditional stuff work in Hadoop land, which I think is um, a dead end, honestly, uh, because you know, the, the, the uh, like success, when you get there you realize that that's not, what's the success, that's not success. You, you just recreated a model that had a lot of inherent flaws in it. Yeah, but so when you go into an account, um, if you're talking to a line of business person, the last thing they're going to say is that their objective is just to you know, preserve their current data warehouse infrastructure. Sure, they don't sure, know sure. it, they don't care about yeah. it, but there must be a segment of the population that says, okay, yes, we want to, we want all these great insights, but we yeah. also want to leverage this investment that we've made over the last 20 years. What do you yeah. do in that situation? Do you run, not walk? No, I think, I think, I mean, I think we're very uh, clear with them, which is that, look, you, you, you're not going to throw away any of your existing investments, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of good use cases that are being served by them. But I think the biggest, I think the biggest learning that companies have is they start out saying, okay, I have Hadoop and I, I'm gonna, I have a data warehouse, I add Hadoop, and I want to pre-process data in Hadoop and put the, the arrow goes from Hadoop into the data warehouse so that the real work happens in the data warehouse. And I think they, the, the, the challenge is you end up with silos of data, you end up with a model where Hadoop doesn't have all the data and the data warehouse doesn't have all the data and you have frustrated customer, frustrated, frustrated users. And the, the, the next step of maturity is you flip the arrow and you start putting all that data into Hadoop. So you still have your existing systems, but there's a whole class of new questions that you can enable because you now have data that may span much, like a wider variety of silos. Some of the banking customers we, we work with, they're thinking about how do I do a 360 degree view of a customer analysis with all these different silos of data that if I was to try to integrate in a traditional sense, it would be a decade long project but just landing that data in Hadoop can be the beginning of doing this very, very rapidly in an agile fashion. Well, and the problem with that, what you described, is you get business processes established for each one of those data silos yeah. that are very rigid. Yeah. So <laughs> talk about how your customers are changing their business processes. Yeah, um, I mean, one is we, we sidestep that a little bit because we don't try to replace the existing systems. You know, if they're doing transactional work and it's working in those environments, uh, that's good. We don't want to be in that business. But I think that, you know, the, the key is, that data is a resource that can be combined with other things in a way that you know you, we're not we're not trying to 
go in and replace the existing re-platform re re your reports. We're mm. trying to help you answer more interesting questions that aren't being answered today, so the bar is very, very low. And so once you get those data sets, as long as you can start to unify some of the common, you know, if I'm thinking about 360 degree of a customer, well, what is a customer? Do I have keys that I can match up in some way? Can I view this in a holistic way? Um, but then I can, if I add new, if I have new uh, data being generated, if I get into mobile advertising and I have all these different new events related to mobile behavior, as long as I can key that to customer, now I can weave that in, have this sort of dimension or entity centric view of it rather than the traditional star schema which becomes like this just heavy, heavy weight thing to, to, you know, to manipulate. And I want to ask you about, so it's the news here, you got some certification, you guys are certified with Hortonworks yeah. now, obviously you certified technology partner with Cloudera as well. Absolutely. You're in the ecosystem, right? Yeah, so you're in the 